is a double major in psychology and criminal justice and is the president of the Criminal Justice Club. So I work very closely with her. She's also a member of the Psychology Club, Gender and Sexuality Alliance, and Black Students United. She's a commuter assistant for first year students and a writer for the Oracle Yearbook. What inspires her most about art and its relationship with activism is that art, she describes, is a universal language whose versatility and depth is capable of reaching the hearts of millions. There are so many ways one can get involved in artivism without being considered a traditional or professional artist. It's welcoming to all and it's able to spark discussions that words cannot begin to capture. So with that, I welcome Anna. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction, Dr. Wright. Um, hi everyone, my name is Anna Morris. Um, and tonight in my role as an Artivism student ambassador, I'd like to share a little bit about the Clothesline Project that the Criminal Justice Club organizes each year on campus and how you, your club or organization or class can get involved. The event coordinated with Take Back the Night later that night is scheduled for April 22nd the rain date of April 29th. We're hoping that by then enough students, faculty and staff will have been vaccinated and that at least some will get to enjoy this outside exhibit in person. Those students who work at the event will of course practice all social distancing, mask and other COVID safety protocols all day. If you cannot participate in person, you can fill out a Google form that will be sent out in the chat later. So you can make a digital submission or of a design you would like to see represented at the event. If you're interested in participating, please contact me or Professor Lake, um, and both of the emails will be listed in the chat. The original clothesline project took place as a reaction to the statistic of 51,000 women who were killed during the time of the Vietnam War, mostly by men who supposedly loved them. In the summer of 1990, that statistic became the catalyst for a coalition of women's groups on Cape Cod, Massachusetts to consciously develop a program that would educate, break the silence, and bear witness to one issue, violence against, against women. The concept of the project was simple. Let each woman tell her story in her own unique way, using words and or artwork to decorate a shirt. Once finished, she would then hang her shirt on a clothesline. This very action serves many purposes. It acts as an educational tool for those who come to view the clothesline. It becomes a healing tool for anyone who makes a shirt by hanging the shirt on the line. By, by hanging the shirt on the line, survivors, friends, and family can literally turn their back on some of the, that pain of their experience and walk away. Finally, it allows those who are still suffering in silence to understand that they are not alone. At the moment, we estimate that there are at least 500 projects nationally and internationally with an estimated 50,000 to 60,000 shirts. We know of projects in 41 states and five countries. This ever-expanding grassroots network is as far flung as Tanzania and as close as Orleans, Massachusetts. Adelphi's clothesline project has evolved over the past 15 years to highlight not just the plight of women and girls who have experienced interpersonal violence, but also the plight of anyone who has experienced sex or gender-based violence, including those that have recently experienced staggering levels of violence in the transgender and gender non-conforming communities. The Clothesline Project honors survivors as well as victims of intimate violence. Any person who has experienced such violence at any time in their life is encouraged to come forward and design a shirt. Victims, families, and friends are also invited to participate. Please join us in making this powerful visual display on campus this spring. And now I would like to introduce our main speaker today, Professor Ariro Aguilarakis. RJ Mutafis Aguilarakis, painter and illustrator, earned her BFA at the School of Visual Arts, her MA at Adolfo University, and is a part-time faculty member at both universities. Her courses explore her passion for art, drawing for her, from her experience as a published illustrator in archaeology, anthropology, and art. She has taught scientific illustration, food, culture, and art, and ethnobotany. She teaches benefits of art therapy, art behind bars, art as social justice and activism, and the relationship of art and science. Her paintings, abstract or surreal, are influenced by her technical illustrations, yet break free from them, finding beauty in the purest forms in our natural environment, aiming to convey a rhythm or harmony of color, form, and hope. 
Her passion for art and believing in the value of incorporating the arts and education to all individuals and communities has brought her to a position on, on the programming committee at both the Center for the Women of New York and the Hellenic Women's Alliance. Follow her on Instagram at RG Arts. Okay, thank you everybody for being here. I will try and keep mine short because we have many speakers here today and what they have to say is probably even more important than what I have to say. Um, so let me just share my screen. Okay, you can see this, right? Mm -hmm. All righty. Okay. So I wanted to start out with a, a quote. Um, it's by Grace Lee Boggs. Uh, she's Chinese American, an activist, a writer, and, and she was, sorry, an advocate for civil and um, labor rights. If you haven't seen the film American Revolution, The Evolution of Grace Lee Boggs, you should. It's amazing. She was an amazing individual. Um, so you should see that. And the quote is, love isn't about what we did yesterday. It's about what we do today and tomorrow and the day after. Uh, so in art therapy, and we will swing back to this at the end, the seven functions of art by Alain Depotin Art as Therapy are remembering, hope, sorrow, rebalancing, self-understanding, growth, and appreciation. Um, I created um, many classes, many independent studies and independent um, readings. I have some of my old students here today. Thank you, Samantha, for coming. Um, and from what, in my experience, what the arts do is um, it makes people feel empathy. It fine tunes their observational skills. Uh, they learn to pay attention to real details. They become informed and they learn to inform. They are inspired and they inspire. Their communication skills are fine tuned. Art provokes, uh, it helps you express your feelings. It gives you or allows for tolerance, self-expression, it commemorates. It may be narrative, persuasive, ritualistic, ceremonial. It is very important to all cultures. Well-being, it's interdisciplinary. It helps to focus on ethnically, racially, and culturally diverse issues and allows for different perspectives. So, teaching cops to see. Uh, Amy Herman, uh, the art of perception, visual intel intelligence, uh, teaches classes and has also written several books on teaching um, police to see, right? Um, she takes them to the Museum of, of, of Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and what it does is it gives law enforcement the skills to pay attention to details, right? To look at the big picture, stand behind a painting and really look at the big picture at a whole, as a whole, not to just jump in, right? Um, then look at the details. It was first a course for medical students and um, she realized that the uh, students really began to pay close attention to small details. It would be a great course to teach law enforcement. Um, classes like this are taught for the New York Police Department, the US Special Operations, US Department of Defense, and the FBI. And these are two articles, one Smithsonian Magazine, one CNN. You Google, you can find many. So art in medical schools. Art was taught in medical schools up until a little over 100 years ago. And then photography took over, it became too complicated and they did away with um, drawing in medical schools. What it does is it's made its comeback, right? Yale, Penn State, Columbia and Harvard all teach um, art to their medical students. It fine tunes their observational skills. It, it um, helps with their visual training. It's teamwork, again, communication skills, bias awareness, and it teaches them to pay attention to narratives, what people are saying, what people are thinking, to take a step back and listen, to observe. STEM and STEAM, 
interdisciplinary approach to teaching and learning. Uh, Cindy McGuire will recognize the young lady in the photograph. Um, and I would like for Cindy to touch base later with Felicia's Promise because they are in the process of developing STEM and STEAM. So STEM, uh, STEAM rather, is art-based research. You can look at Ruth Bernstein to look at, um, read a little bit more, maybe watch some of his videos. It combines various disciplines, the arts, psychology, education, anthropology, to better understand and challenge the human experience. Art enhances all disciplines. It engages students. It solidifies the understanding of concepts, and it also gives you the opportunity to be more creative in your problem solving. Scientific illustration, what students learn. And I may ask my old students to give their input later. Um, the two images on the left are pencil drawings. They were completed by a student who was a biology major, not an art major, who did go on to get her degree in um, scientific illustration. Uh, my students have shown their work and their research at Anchor as well as at Adelphi. The picture on the uh, lower right is a uh, pencil on colored paper. Uh, there is a video on YouTube, which is scientific illustration. So if you go to YouTube and search for scientific illustration, you will find this YouTube under Adelphi. It does come up and it shows you what the class dynamics are or were. Uh, students were very engaged. They were very involved. It was someplace they came to where it was their Zen place, where they could create, where they could really study on the materials they were learning. Um, it didn't matter whether it was anthropology or biology or nursing. Um, it really, really helped um, in their learning process. The benefits of scientific illustration, uh, over a hundred years ago, it was a necessity. You learn to see, and that's what my students always said at the end of each of my classes, at the end of each semester is they learn to see. They no longer look to trees and leaves as a generic tree or a generic leaf. Everything was unique in its own way. And it's not until you sit down to draw it and to make the decision as to how you're going to um, interpret this, how you're going to present this. It's, it's uh, problem solving. Um, in biology, there is more, there is a more thorough understanding of the subject at hand, right? So in anatomy, you're really looking at all the nooks and crannies and all the little holes. Um, there are art students that work alongside medical students with cadavers now. There are actual programs that allow these two disciplines to work together. Uh, they focus on detail and not skip over what we believe we know. Because as we know from brain studies and neuroesthetics and neuroscience, our brain tends to fill in the blanks. So if you're looking at like an abstract painting, you don't actually have to see something completely drawn out for you. You can fill in the blanks of what you see. Well, scientific illustration takes you back and really forces you to see all the fine um, details. Scientific illustrators do have some artistic license as to what materials they're going to be used. And then um, you always have to remember not everything could be captured with a photograph. You need the work of an illustrator. Uh, food, culture, and art. Students learned about different um, cultures through art, um, about their cuisine. Oops, sorry, I have a typo. Um, you learn what each of these students' stories were, their narratives. This class started out as a, uh, a class on um, cultures and food and what you could tell about um, a culture through art and works of art. That turned into something so much more. Um, students designed their own cookbooks throughout the entire semester. They presented. Uh, their works became their own narrative and almost, um, um, Mm, they, they, like dedication to their families, to their grandmothers, to their mentors. Um, we learned about movements in arts, biases, injustices, race and gender issues, food deserts. It was interdisciplinary. Mm, we learned about people, cultures, rituals, art and art history, and film. Art meets science, which is, um, I don't know if I have a favorite, 
I think they're my favorite at the time I'm teaching them. And then when I teach the next one, that then becomes my favorite. Um, in Art Meets Science, we explore the relationship between the histories of art and science, how the, they were one and then they were separated. We learn about the scientific method versus the artistic method, which isn't all that much different, right? We all have a theory, we have a picture in mind, we have a process. If it works, we keep it. If it doesn't, we learn from our mistakes, we scrap it, we go back. Um, so we do have that same um, planning process an idea in mind. We learn about Da Vinci, Vesalius, um, Van Kalker, Galileo, Ramon Mahal, Darwin, Florence Nightingale, who was not just a nurse, right? Beatrix Potter, who did not just write Peter Rabbit, and Oliver Wolf Sacks and all of his works. Uh, we learn about neuroaesthetics, Eric Kandel, brain disorders in art, how um, artists create art and What's interesting and scary at the same time, because you tend, I think sometimes the more you know, the scarier it gets, because I'll look back at my drawings and see, are there any signs of early dementia? Because in early works before, before dementia really comes out, right? And, and is evident, it's evident in artists' work. Um, and other brain disorders, neuroaesthetics is a brand new field, right? It's not all that old. Uh, Johns Hopkins has a, a neuroaesthetics program, which is incredible. We learn about reductionism in art, technology in art, bio art, using biological materials for art, artificial intelligence. Is it art? Is it not? There's always that debate in art about everything. Is it art or is it not art and who's to say? And ethics, uh, the relationship of art and math, physics and art, art therapy and anthropology and art. Uh, science and art are as closely bound together as the lungs and the heart, so that if one organ is perverted, the other cannot act rightly. That's uh, What is Art by Leo Tolstoy. If you have a chance, you should read it. It's not too long. It's, it's just, or at least the, the bullet points. Student achievements. Uh, my students have gone on to become archaeological and scientific illustrators. Uh, they become journalists. They collaborate with other instructors because when an instructor needs uh, an illustration or a work or a graph for one of their publications, um, they hire one of my students. The two uh, prehistoric ones were a student, it was from a student, Saeed Bonra, who did her interdisciplinary degree at Adelphi on scientific illustration. Um, Adelphi University is unique in that it gives students the opportunity to design their own major. So there is no major at Adelphi for scientific illustration. She teamed up with me, with Dr. Demick from biology, and with uh, Jeff Brogan from art, and she completed her degree and did its illustrations. Uh, dental students learn about dentition. They learn more about dental morphology after having drawn each individual tooth. Um, lithics, uh, when the archaeology department needed stone tools illustrated, my students were trained to do them. I had students um, who went on to do museum studies, who became nurses, anthropologists, archaeologists in political science, criminal justice, and forensics. I've had many students um, present at different forums. And some quick pictures here of students and their work. So this past fall, um, Dr. Lake asked me if I would like to teach a class for criminal justice. Um, she was very brave, I think, in doing so because I don't know if she knew exactly what she was getting with me. Uh, so we developed a course in the fall, Art Behind Bars, Artist Therapy. Uh, it did really well. There was a lot of interest by our students. So we developed a second class this spring, Artistic Activism and Social Justice. I learned a lot. I learned so much um, about the injustices in our criminal justice system. Um, the final for the class in the, in the fall were students needed to create their own non-for-profit or organizations. And they needed to create a mission statement, a vision, hashtags. Uh, they needed to research where they would go to funding or complete their fundraising. So 
this would be then um, an organization at the very beginning stages, but so very doable. This from undergraduate students. We don't know where they'll go with this, hopefully someplace, but we are connecting them through this Artivism Initiative with organizations, some of which you'll meet later today. I wanted to give you some of their proposals. One was breath of life, storytelling, bringing back the art of storytelling, connecting to who you are, right? Who your family is, who your, you know, your community, um, reconnect with your roots and keep it going. I so regret not um, taping my mother or my grandmother when they told those stories. Now we just depend on what we remember or think we remember. Um, and now it's so easy with all the iPhones to just you know record our, our, our loved ones and our neighbors. Uh, so one was Breath of Life storytelling, a little paint, a little hope, line of duty art, the Judy Ledoan Art Therapy Project, uh, this was for uh, the young lady's grandmother who died of cancer. Another Way Out, which was brilliant. This student who uh, was fortunate enough to have parents that um, kept him in and at bay, whereas most of his friends and others in his community were off doing all kinds of things, um, getting into trouble, thinking the only way out was sports, gangs or drugs. So what he designed was a project which is um, another way out to provide in a community center um, arts, give them another way out, uh, other things to do, a home, someplace to belong, uh, art of the mind, chance to dance, dance to inspire. And I think one of my favorite was hashtag no more hashtag. And that because um, enough of hashtags, right? It seems that's all we're doing is we're hearing about everything and we're doing hashtag, you know, hashtag, hashtag. It's time we do something and not just post it to social media, put a name to it in a hashtag and then forget about it until the next thing comes up. So what we learned in these two classes were why the arts are so Im important. What arts? all arts. It's the visual arts, it's theater, it's poetry, it's storytelling, it's dance. Um, art is a human right. Art helps us to heal. It's, um, there are many benefits to the arts for those that are incarcerated. It makes them feel human. It makes them feel like they have a purpose. Um, most you, we saw from their work, because we did look at much of their work, um, were portraits. Why portraits? Because portraits made them human. They were no longer a mugshot or an ID card, an ID badge. Their inmates had faces. It was something they can send home to their loved ones. Um, for young people, we know the benefits of. For communities, uh, we explored Aggie Gund, Gun, sorry, who sold a painting by Joy Lichtenstein, uh, um, sorry, by Roy Lichtenstein for $150 million and she put aside $100 million for the, this Arts for Justice Fund. Uh, my class did see the movie, it's amazing. If you haven't seen it, you should because it shows that there still are a lot of good people and in her case, a very good rich person. Um, she also funded at the MAMA PS1, Museum of Modern Art, in Queens, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Incarceration. Uh, there is a book, Nicole R. Fleetwood. Just checking time. So what did we learn? We learned about women and the lack of in the arts. We learned about ACT UP, Unseen, In Decline, the Art Workers Coalition, um, honoring African-American art therapy pioneers. I'm constantly learning. And what my classes these past two semesters forced me to do was to really look at why aren't there any African-American art therapists? I know they're there. It wasn't until 2019 that the Art Therapy Association actually recognized, I think there were five of them, right? Who were at the same time as the ones we knew were at the forefront of art therapy at the time, right? In the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. Um, we learned a lot about solitary confinement, 
what it does to people uh, mentally, what it does to their vision, what it does to their well-being. And sure, of course, we always go back to people have committed horrible crimes. They are doing time, but there are also so many that have not, that can't afford lawyers and bail are, that are in prison just waiting to be exonerated or have their cases heard. We learned about the Gorilla Girls. Um, you can look into all of these separately. It's just way too much to go into. College Behind Bars, Prison Arts, Black Lives Matters, Harlem on My Mind, the Harlem Renaissance, which I think there should be a chorus in every university about the Harlem Renaissance. I don't, I know Adelphi doesn't have one. I don't know where there is, but in Harlem was so rich and um, still is, right? Uh, there is a book the New York Times published recently, um, which is called Unseen. There were photographs that were taken back in the day by uh, the first African-American photographer for the New York Times, but the pictures were never published in the newspaper at the time. But this is a book that always has the narrative to the photographs. I really recommend um, looking into it. The Clothesline Project, which Adelphi would, will have on April 22nd, it does go back a little bit further than um, 1990 in Massachusetts. The original idea was by Monica Mayor in 1978 in Mexico City. And what she did was she posted these little cards with a prompt, a question, and clipped it on a string on a clothesline with a, with the clothespin. And what she wrote was, "Why? What I hate about this city, Mexico City." And what she found later uh, was what they hated about mostly had to do with their experience um, with sexual harassment and domestic violence. Um, this clothesline, the clothesline was a metaphor for women's work. Uh, participants became one with the art exhibit. They became this live working art exhibit. It then came to Los Angeles in 1979, 1990 in Massachusetts, and it's been at Adelphi now for many, many years. I think, was it 12, 15 years now? 15, yeah. Yeah, 15. So artivism, what is art really? Um, well, art should be accessible to all. It's a powerful tool for transformation. It reveals injustices. It informs and it demands change. It's a human right. Uh, art strengthens communities. It inspires. It moves away from the establishment and into the public. So sometimes you have to take your art to the streets, to the public, to social media, to get your message across. I think there is more responsibility now on artists more than ever, right? Uh, because we are the means, the voice to get things out there. Um, and we should serve a purpose as artists to give that voice. And we should try to advance social justice issues. These are some quotes. And when, we, when I teach um, Art Meets Science, we see that so many scientists were and are artists. You know, you have Albert Einstein, creativity is intelligence, having fun. He was a musician, he played the violin. You have Eric Kandel, who was a neuroscientist, right? Who also studies neuroaesthetics and the importance of the arts and how our brains and our brains interpret and understand aesthetics. Uh, the greatest artists are, are scientists or artists as well. He who poses science and art, sorry, possesses science and art, possesses religion as well. He who possesses neither of these had better find religion. Um, and Escher and so much more. So what is art to me? Art to me is my world. It's my entire world. It's everything. It's what I resort to when I'm happy, when I'm sad, when I'm in quarantine. Um, I incorporate it in, in all of my work. Um, my art is no longer about making pretty pictures you hang on the wall. I wanted to be something more. It brought me to these four incredible organizations, the Hellenic Women's Alliance, whose slogan is open door, open books, right? This is the Greek American community um, where you want open books also, right? This is what we do. This is what we brought in. This is what we're spending. So we started as a um, part of a larger organization and realized we could do more as women 
on our own. So I am on their program committee. Um, they give food to the homeless, toys. They set up uh, uh, tables in Astoria in Long Island City over the, uh, the, the holidays where we just had collected this huge donations of toys and gave them out. Uh, we do a lot there. The Center for Women of New York, who will speak next. Felicia's Promise, where I'll be teaching two summer classes for their young ladies. And the uh, Los Saida Project. I don't know if Alejandro is here, but I, if he's not, I will tell you about that later. Um, hopefully next year, I'll be working with Irini Linaraki with Occupy 3. She is here. We can ask her to speak maybe a little bit later. And my next big project that has goes back to my art and archeological illustration, will be drawing um, Neolithic lithics um, from Apostolemis in Crete in Greece. So that takes me to my end. I'm sorry, I, I, I tend to speak very quickly. I'm not sharing anymore, correct? Correct. You're okay. Doing. Okay, so, um, this is all that I do. Um, I believe in the power of art. Uh, it should be incorporated in everything. It makes a difference in everybody's life. Um, I will first introduce Cecilia from the Center of Women of New York, who is also joined by, uh, with, sorry, Melanie Shaw. You can tell us a little bit about the Center for Women. Thank you so much, RG. Uh, you are such an inspiration. And I'm so glad that someone like you is inspiring uh, students uh, not to hang their paintings, their pictures on the walls, but to do something with our, their art. So thank you so much. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what um, the center does, if I may share uh, my screen. It says that the host disabled uh, partici uh, participant screen sharing. Yes. It looks like I cannot share the screen. Oh, I don't know um, who is here. Uh, oh, wait, maybe I can do it. Give me one sec. Here we go. I got it. Okay. So now, perfect. All right. So the Center for the Women of New York um, has like two locations in Queens. One is in Queensboro Hall and one is in Fort Totten. Uh, that location is newer. Uh, we were ready to start using it when COVID happened, but we're very much looking forward to having events such as an art exhibit uh, when, when the pandemic allows it. Uh, so we're very happy to have RG on board uh, in our organization. My name is RG Sarez, the city of Enestawego, and I am a vice president together with Malini Shah, who's joining me today. And I'm a chair of the programs committee. Um, our, our mission, uh, the Center for the Women of New York uh, advocates for women's rights and full equality for women since 1987 uh, when uh, CWNY was founded. And we have been empowering women to reach their full potential by, by offering services that provide the skills, information, and support they need to address economic, emotional, and legal challenges. So uh, this year, because of uh, the vast women's needs due to the pandemic, uh, our focus has been on women, uh, women's well-being and health, uh, both physical and mental. And first, apparently, like it was physical health, but then we realized that because of isolation, uh, women needed um, a lot of help, uh, you know, mental health. Uh, and RG has. Uh, brought to our uh, programs, uh, Artist Therapy, uh, a webinar that so many women came and, and were able to enjoy and be inspired by what she did. We also focus on women's safety and as well as uh, women's financial independence. So we offer both educational programs as well as support services and classes. Uh, some of our um, topics are domestic violence, trafficking awareness, health and wellness, financial literacy and independence, and career advancement. And we offer uh, a caregiver support for those of us who take care of elderly family members or friends. We have a women in crisis support group 
uh, English as a second language classes. We have a legal team. Um, there were, it's a group of attorneys that respond via email. Uh, we have uh, fitness, fitness classes, uh, both uh, Zumba and cardio resistance, and we do offer referrals. This is one of the programs that RG uh, brought to us and with it jointly. Uh, she, uh, as I mentioned, presented as a therapy. Uh, we found uh, ourselves all doodling and like, I don't know, like it just brought, it was in the middle of the pandemic and it was such, um, I don't know, a deep breath that we could all take um, with her presentations. We thank you so much and, and people have asked us to do it again and to do something in person. And as I said, we're look, very much looking forward to having some activities outdoors now that the weather allows it. This was another event that we had. It was uh, cocktails and art and uh, we had a violinist. So uh, we had three women in, in the arts, uh, um, Erica Walsh. We had um, an actress, Stuart Hamilton and RG as our visual artist. And it was such a, also a lovely time uh, sharing all the forms of art and how it can be so therapeutic and it can connect us all especially during these hard times. Some of our upcoming events are, we have um, an annual, um, it used to be a luncheon, but now it will be via Zoom uh, coming up on the 29th of April. We will recognize our women in leadership. We'll have a health fair in May, a career conference in June, or an art exhibit, and hopefully it can be in person. We're so excited to, that will be one of our first in-person uh, programs in our new location and um, you're all invited uh, if you stay tuned you'll and we'll share with RG and uh, it will be outdoors it's a forge it's beautiful it's next to the water um, it will be also on women's issues we'll have a green team um, we'll be having our gardening classes and activities um, we'll have in the summer uh, summer months, we'll have a book club on women's issues as well as a film club. And the film club, we're also hoping to do it uh, in person. Archie, thank you so much for, for having the Center for the Women of New York. Uh, this is our contact information. Um, our website is cwny.org, so find us there as well as we're on social media, Center for the Women of New York. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Melanie. And up next, we will have Felicia um, Von Rose, uh, Ebony, and is she still here? She is still here, right? You want to take it over, Felicia? Hi, everyone. And the, the third person you were going to introduce was Anjanette Arjun. Anjanette, you are <laughs> Okay. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to meet you all virtually. I thank you all for having me. Audrey, thank you so much for having Felicia's Promise attend and, and speak. I am Felicia Ponrose, the founder and executive director of Felicia's Promise. We are a newly formed nonprofit organization developing a program to assist underserved young ladies of color ages 12 to 18 in underrepresented, underrepresented communities. And we are starting in Brooklyn, New York. I myself am a product of foster care, kinship foster care, my grandmother's love. She fostered me along with several other children in my family. It was a definite struggle. And some of the things that I met were homelessness, physical and sexual abuse, a lack of basic resources, and a lot of the basic things that could just help young girls uh, thrive. The struggle is the same today for so many young ladies of color. So God placed Felicia's promise on my heart in September of 2019. We started out as a ministry at, at my church, Bethany Baptist Church. And during that time, we gave a holiday drive for 15 young ladies in transitional housing. I'm switching from calling our young ladies from girls to young ladies. So bear with me, I'm like going back and forth. So they are young ladies of color. We gave a fundraiser and gifted each young lady a laptop right before COVID. 
And so we planned to have a mentoring group session every Saturday the following summer, but of course we couldn't do that. So instead I took the COVID time and decided to launch a full 501c3. So that's where we are now. And we will start this summer with a thriving summer program for our 15 girls that will be selected. Our application process starts this Friday and we will select 15 young girls. Our program will be customized based on the needs of each girl's need. So if they want to be a dancer, we will uh, get a resource for them to be able to dance. If they want to be a doctor, we will get resources for them to become a doctor. We will get resources for whatever it is that they need. Although we're new, we are excited to be partnering with so many up and coming and already established nonprofits that can assist us along the way. Um, my program director, Anjanette Pierre, will tell you more about all of the programs that we're going to offer our young ladies. And Ebony Meeks Lately, who is a board member as well, and our fabulous publicist will have some words for you as well and I will look forward to any questions this was really brief and fast because there are three of us but if you have any questions for me afterwards I will answer any questions that you have. Anjanette? You're, you're muted sweetie. Sorry about that. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to give you a little bit of information about Felicia's Promise. We are really excited to start the program this summer. Um, and of course, because of COVID, it will be virtual, but our ultimate goal is that these programs will be in person. This summer, the programs will run from July the 12th through August the 19th for two days a week. We are going to have five different workshop areas. So one will focus on hair, another will be crocheting, another will be fitness, another will be civics, and another will be art. And the girl, young ladies will be making masks. We selected these areas because we really believe that they cover various facets of life that impact them and can have a role in their development. Needless to say, your organization recognizes the many benefits of art and its role in activism and the community. And we recognize that as well and are so proud to be able to have that as an aspect of our program. We believe that art is a way for young ladies to express themselves and to become more in touch with what they're thinking and feeling. And as, you, as you've already heard, your very own RG will be leading one of the, uh, the art workshops and she'll be helping the young ladies create their very own masks. As indicated earlier, the programs will be virtual and are going to be the foundation of our program when they will become done in person and all of that is COVID pending. And at this point, you'll hear some more information from our board member, Ebony Meeks Lately. Hi everyone, I just wanna thank you again for having us. We are very, very excited. As Felicia mentioned, we are a fairly new organization and um, we're just hitting the ground running. So we're really, uh, excited to be able to share what we have going on with you. Um, we are planning some virtual events, potentially in person, depending on how COVID treats us. Uh, but we do plan on having um, a summer event with the um, a date to be determined. And we have our holiday event. That'll be the first Saturday in December. Um, we, if you, I'm going to put this information also in the chat, but I'm going to say it out loud for you all. If you have any um questions. If you know anyone who's interested in being a mentee, our mentee application is up on our website, which is feliciaspromise.org. And you can email us at info at feliciaspromise.org. Also, um, if you know anyone who's interested in, in volunteering, we do have our volunteer application will be up by May 1st. Um, we're looking forward to continuing to uh, work with you all and hopefully securing um, some interns or having some of your, your students work with our organization and help our young ladies develop and grow. We're really excited to work with RG and um, to introduce art to our young ladies in a way that they might not have uh, expressed it or used it before. Um, and again, I'm gonna put all this information in the chat that we'll have our virtual event, our, our spring event, our holiday event, um, our um, mentees, if you know any young girls, young ladies in uh, the tri-state area, we're starting in Brooklyn. Um, 
please let them know about our organization and have them apply. Uh, and I will have all that information in the chat. So I just want to thank you again. And if you have any questions for either of us, we are happy to take them. I also wanted to introduce Melanie Shaw. She's not only at the Center for Women of New York, but she's also co-chair, am I correct, Melanie? at Felicia's Promise. Um, that's how I met Malini, um, connected me with the Center for Women, and then kind of got me in with Felicia's Promise. So thank you. Um, uh, Alejandro Torres is not here. I will just share my screen for just a minute. I do real quickly. I see Dr. Tracy Dua is on. She is our, uh, on the board uh, for development for Felicia's Promise. I just wanted to shout her out. Do you want to say anything? My uh, collaborators and Felicia's Promise folks have said it all. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Great, great. I will just show you um, very quickly what the uh, Lusaida Center is. They have been around since, hold on. Okay, uh, you see my screen, correct? Okay, they are on the Lower East Side. Uh, they've been around for over 40 years. They work in their community. Uh, they have a festival every year. Their contact information, uh, uh, we'll, we'll be putting up on our landing page a link that will uh, be internships. So uh, if anybody's in, interested in participating, joining, volunteering, interning with any of these organizations, we'll have all that on one link. Uh, they have an art residency program, all arts. A new building they've just developed. I'm sorry he's not here. He would have done a better job at all of this. But um, we'll get him back. We'll get him back. Um, so I would really love at some point for Felicia's promise to connect with uh, Professor Cindy McGuire because she is our STEAM person here. Um, so if you have any doubt about STEM and not STEAM, you really should speak to Cindy McGuire. She'll help you with that. Um, any questions? I'm sorry, before we get into questions, I would first like to thank um, our speakers uh, for today, Professor Kilarakis, the Center for the Women of New York, Felicia's Promise, and the Lewis Status Center for being our artivists today. And before we open up the floor to questions for our presenter, we would like to ask you to participate in a short poll that should pop up right now um, for everyone to answer. I don't know if it's popping up right now. Can you guys see it? Not yet. Um, and also, Irini is here from Greece. Irini, do you want to tell us a little bit about your Occupy project? Sure. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry, it's late and my son is sleeping next to me. So oh. if you hear snoring, it's him. It's not me. <laughs> I'm paying attention. <laughs> hey, hello, everyone. Hi, Irini. Irini is from Greece. Yes, I'm on the island of Crete, so it's midnight soon for me. Um, I uh, thank you, Argy, for mentioning the project. Everybody here has all these amazing projects. Um, we, I'm a visual artist, I do public art, and uh, we did Occupy One in February 2020, which was a collaboration between uh, the Greek Consulate General in New York and the culture services of the French embassy in the United States. Uh, because, I mean, it started because I have a dual citizenship and I realized that's just for the anecdote that, um, which is funny, that I was always considered one or the other in always the other country. I don't know how to say it, it's very late. So basically, whenever I was in France, I was considered a Greek artist. And whenever I was in Greece, I was seen as a French artist. And 
and so forth. So I started um, gathering uh, friends who uh, were in similar situations and we were, you know, we were talking about all the different uh, social uh, issues, about all the different identity issues that artists have and, you know, in all our spoiled worlds, we were um, considering all this stuff. And then we said uh, that uh, we had to be more, um, how can I say this? That we had to be more of uh, activists. I don't know what's the way to say this. And that we had to show more about our uh, actions, about social um, justice, you know, and to speak out because artists were always considered in France and in Greece as, as this, creatures that were never concerned with uh, social issues, which I know is not the case in the United States. Uh, so we always had to be, you know, these um, conceptual beings that never had to deal at all with our society or any issues we encountered as women, you know, as many, many things. And then as we were all doing this progress through, um, through our issues, we understood or we, we, we uh, became aware of the fact that we could not be something else than being artists, okay? Um, and I'm saying something very personal, it's late, so bear with me. Uh, so we understood that we could not be artists slash activists, okay? We could not be artists slash, you know, uh, whatever. We needed to be artists and to put all these social issues within our work, okay? And we needed to create a project to speak of exactly that, that we were part of a society as artists, that we were using, you know, the means that we had to um, address these issues. And we created, and, 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 we um, we we um, we talked about Occupy, about the movement Occupy, right? That started in New York like uh, so many years ago, but ha has created a sort of continue continuity for uh, people to go out in the streets and talk when they're not represented, right? And artists sort of slowly became more of um, uh, became more aware of their power to do that as well as well as you know people go and it seems like we're all in this together because you know all these movements that have been happening like um, in France it's uh, the yellow vests I don't know if you know what the yellow vests are you know black lives matter and so on and so on and we're all out there and it seems that art can walk hand in hand you know, with all these social uh, struggles. So anyways, that's how we created Occupy One. And uh, we um, emphasized on the idea that artists are part of their community and that they create very strong networks that are not, um, you know, only art related. And then we did Occupy 2, which came back to Greece, and it's a collaboration with the French Institute. And we address a lot of issues that it will be too long to say here. And now we created a network between several countries with art institutions, art schools, and so on and so on. And now we want to take it back to New York as a sort of organic, you know, little trip. See, it's late, so I feel very free to tell and you things like this. <laughs> and Vini will be one of our fall presenters, so you'll be hearing a lot more um, about Occupy, and hopefully we will, this Artivism Initiative will also be involved and have our students more directly involved from beginning to end and not just popping in and out, correct, Vini? <laughs> yes. <laughs> an entire semester of uh, collaborating with um, Ms. Linavaki and Occupy 3. Yes. Thank you for that Thank wonderful you, presentation, Ms. Narzaki. I'd like to pop in just quickly. Anna, would you like to finish up on that little um, info that we have for our again, audience today, please, while we wait for the poll? And also, thank you for the wonderful presenters. There it is. Hi, I just had to say the, one of the magical words. Let's take a second while Anna informs us of upcoming information, please. So yes, thank you so much again to our speakers today. Um, 
Yeah. Um, before we are I would like for you to participate in the short poll. Um, and also, I would like for you to know that our next Artivism event in the Artivism series, which is um, indige Indigenous Poetry and Women, and this will take place Thursday, um, the 8th, this Thursday at 4 p.m. And for more information on this and all of this series events, you can go to the website www.adelphi.edu slash artivism. It will be in the chat as well. And also you can follow us on Instagram at artivism for shared humanity or simply Google artivism and Adelphi. All of this will be in the chat. Um, and also we are also hosting an open call art installation for all creative thinkers in our Instagram. And if you would like to get more involved in this year long initiative, please contact Dr. Stephanie Lee or Carolina Carbonero. Um, all the info will be in the chat. And yes, at this point, um, we would like to ask if there's any questions for our artists and our presenters. So be sure to use the raise hand feature or tell us in the chat. Did everybody get a chance to complete the poll? Thumbs up if you did. Yep. Oh, good. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, just before we go and open it to uh, the Q&A, uh, again, thank you all for being here, our presenters. And this is exactly what this initiative is hoping to create, a network, a community of people that want to transform society via your passion. So I would like to maybe just start it off with a little question on the chat. What is your passion? What ignites you to see that change that we're so long in, in this society? And this initiative is hosted by Adelphi University, Goddessman's Library, Teachers College of Columbia University, and Sing for Hope. Anyone that would like to be part of it as a student ambassador, like Anna, our wonderful student ambassador today, let's give her an excellent thumbs up for her, right? She did a wonderful job. Or if you'd like to be a presenter like all the others that we have today, please just reach out to us. We also hope to see your creative work in the Instagram uh, exhibition that we're hosting. So now the floor is open. Let's hear those questions. Well, thank you everybody for being here. It's nice to see some of my older students, Samantha and Julian. It's good to see you. Oh, check it out. I just like, I, I would like to have the opportunity to invite everyone, not only to our, um, you know, our recognition of women in, uh, of distinction and men in leadership, uh, but also to volunteer the, uh, and, and to do an internship. There are many opportunities, and since uh, Carolina mentioned passions, uh, that's the way we start. Uh, you know, any volunteer, any intern that comes to our, our organization, we the, that's the first question we ask: like, what's your passion? And there's always something along the lines with your passions. And young people bring so much to the table. So any student, anyone who would like to join us is welcome. Professor Argy, we have a question for you on the chat. It says uh, that you mentioned that some things cannot be captured in a photo. Can you please give us an example of what can be captured in a photo? Oh my God, there's not one thing. There's many things. Sometimes you want to um, have, uh, okay, say an insect, right? You, you have an insect. Um, if you take a picture, you'll either take a photograph of the insect and then another closer photograph of just the wing or just the eye or one little thing. Um, it doesn't always capture that. It doesn't get as close. You can't see the fine details in a photograph no matter how much you try and get it into focus. So that's your starting point. When you're drawing it, you can get into the super fine details. Remember, Samantha, the rapidographs, our super fine pens. <laughs> Um, you, you have the opportunity to get into the really fine nitty gritty. Uh, you choose what to focus on, right? You can show the entire picture and then just a lens, you draw out a lens and you get into the fine details of something else. And it really isn't until you draw something, really, really draw something side by side. That's why medical schools, um, now offer classes to art students in with cadavers where they're working on these bodies, right? 
the artists look at every little notch and nodule on every part of the body where the muscle begins, where the muscle ends, right? Whereas, and they're drawing that out. Whereas the medical student is just cutting, pulling. They're not focusing on every little detail. And that tends to bounce onto uh, the medical students is to really learn to take your time, look at the whole picture and then zoom in. Uh, RG, it's Victoria, yes. can I add to that? Um, I yes. love the question because I have listened to RG explain her technical drawing at our two events and I learned so much that even though technology is the way it is, it, it has advanced us so much, we still need the human eye and the human hand to draw for us for those technical drawings. And RG said it involves great skill with measurement and very technical measurements to skill and that they are more telling than a photograph. So it's really wonderful to see art and science come together in these technical drawings. We also have a comment about mindfulness. Um, I don't know if um, the person that put it in the chat would like to stand on that, perhaps. Okay, hi, my name is Cindy. I'm a colleague of RG's. Um, it's nice to be here with um, a whole crew of people that really believe in the role of the arts to change the world, right? Close to home, further out. Um, one thing I think about art, and I bring this um, both into my teaching, but also the STEAM work I've done, which is this idea of empathy and mindfulness. Like if we're gonna, you know, be agents of change, we need to start with ourselves, right? And um, being, th those are some skills that we need to, some of us are, we're always acquiring those. Um, and I do, I do a lot of K through 12 education, art education. So, that's something that I think about all the time when I'm doing arts with children, youth, and communities, this sort of mindfulness, empathy, and how just the arts are such a great tool for that. And so that attention to the detail, um, that's it, that brought that up for me. I know we're almost, well, we're past time. But it's a wonderful a afternoon like this. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's okay. We stay a little bit longer. Is that all right with everyone? That's fine. I think somebody had a question. Yes, yes. Hi. Uh, yes. Um, RG, you mentioned um, that some of these classes were created or, or influenced by students at Delphi and that it's not a specific major, but I'm just wondering like what, like what other classes would some of your students have in addition to, um, you know, developing this area? Um, in, well, when I started at Delphi, I went in um, to take over for somebody who um, had left <laughs> last minute. So I went in and uh, taught a first year seminar in ethnobotany uh, people, cultures, um, and ethnobotanical cures. Um, it was well received. I did well with my students. So I then taught a class in technical drawing in archaeology and physical anthropology, uh, where we also, it was a class in the fall. And then it was also a class in the summers in Greece, where we took students into the archaeological um, field, right? Uh, where we would do uh, on-site archaeological drawing. From there, we went into scientific illustration. Um, that did really well because it was cross-listed with biology and the art department as well. So I had a lot of biology students, nursing students, uh, communications, or anthropology. I had really uh, large groups. From there, um, we took it a step further and did food culture and art, which uh, was I, I, that was such a great, uh, all of them were, because I had my closets full of art supplies. Students would come in early, you know, they would come in, um, they would just grab their folders, they would grab whatever supplies they needed, they would sit and they would work. And then I, I would look at my clock and I'd be like, oh my God, you know, you have to leave, <laughs> class is over. 
um, we had to remind them, I had to remind them that class is over, it's time to go. Um, and then the food culture and art really explored every movement in art. And it, it we saw even there the injustices, right? So in, in like in, in Renaissance paintings, right, you see what the lower classes ate as compared to the huge banquets that the upper class ate. Um, uh, you know, and we, we traveled the world in that class. Uh, we explored, you know, the, the sugar and slavery and chocolate and, uh, you know, rituals. And students just brought so much of their own culture in. It was this diverse class where we played films, a lot of foreign language films. And while we watched the films and while students presented, everyone else was working on their drawings. So it was a class where class was taking place and they were working on their cookbooks at the same time. Um, and then what else? And then the criminal justice classes, which again, I brought art into. So it really, it's interdisciplinary. It does so much, um, no matter what your degree will be in, it's the way you, 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 um, you cooperate, you react, you act with other students around you, right? Um, there's this respect. Uh, we respect each other's work and space. It's, it's a really, really unique opportunity. At the School of Visual Arts, I, I started there because I took over again when somebody was sick um, to teach a math class. And when I told the chair at the time, I don't think I could teach math, <laughs> but I could teach the relationship of art and math. So they said, well, come in. So um, that went well and we changed it up to art meets science. And that could be that could move into three semesters where each of our topics, um, rather than go week to week, could be you know semester per semester. Uh, we get stuck on anthropology and art and gender issues and realize that you know there were many issues, uh, many genders throughout history, right? There was this fluidity. You had this third gender, uh, non-gender, and people seem to have been more tolerant in the past. I don't know um, where we've come to today. Um, we do, we have a class in, uh, like a week in reductionism, a week in um, medicine and art. It's just uh, very fast. And you can see I talk very quickly too, but I don't seem to really lose my students. They somehow run to keep, ca you know, catch up with me. I don't know if I answered your questions. I, I, I kind of tend to go off because I, I love what I do. <laughs> Let's see. That was great. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And there is one, what, what does it mean when you see young people become involved in your organizations? I, I'll speak very quickly about my students. When they were asked to create an organization of their own, these were real, real life organizations and causes where if they knocked on the door of a shelter, of a house of worship, of a community center, they could so bring their programs in. They were that well prepared and not just well prepared, that passionate about what they could offer and how they could serve their community. And that's also a goal with this initiative is to incorporate all generations. It doesn't matter age, you know, where you are with your resources and where you are right now, that is all you need to be the change for our society, for our world, and for those upcoming generations to, so that they don't have to repeat what we have come through. And as uh, Cecilia from the Center of Women of New York said, um, you, you both inspire young people, and at the same time, you're inspired by them, mm -hmm. right? You learn so, it, it's this reciprocal relationship. You're learning from each other. Um. 
I like to say something. I agree with that. I think it also teaches them how to give back. I know we, with our past event we did this past December, we got seven, about 17 young teenage girls to do a video uh, that we played at our event. And they spoke about what their promise was to themselves. And that was beautiful. And that was a way, because we're just, we're a new organization and we don't have um, young people as a part of it yet, but that was a way for them to be involved and to help inspire other young teenage girls as themselves. So it's helpful for the girls that are receiving it and it's helpful to the givers. For sure. And that's another part of this initiative how can we create a dignified life with opportunities, networks like the ones we're forming here, continue to form for a more um, powerful coexistence? Okay. I think we're good unless somebody else has something more. Here we thought we couldn't get through one semester, right, Carolina? And we filled up the fall, and now we have more. I'm hoping to join our team for the spring of 2022. That's right. Yes, yes. What I, what I really would like to see at some point is maybe once each of these semesters is to have uh, student presenters. Maybe try and do, you know, one or two days where we have, you know, three or four students present their own ideas. And you're all welcome, all of you out there, recent graduates or current students. If you like to make a panel or just present by yourself, just reach out, let us know. Anna, what was the contact info again, please? Oh, yeah, I will uh, put it in the chat again. This is to get connected with Autovism, the any future events. Um, the site is there, the Instagram. Okay. Um, so I'm happy to be working with all of you. Um, I'm sorry Alejandro wasn't able to make it. He had an emergency with his son. Uh, but I will be posting in with our links about the La Zaida um organization and he will maybe we, we can have him speak in the fall as well and i'm happy we're all connected in the ways that we did bake back america has given back um and i will be working with many of these other organizations and with us again i hope um look for that link on how to uh look for internships and uh we're all good Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. So Hope to see you at the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next one will be this Thursday. So good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> Great. It's good to see you, Carolina. Uh -huh, likewise, <laughs> nice meeting you <laughs> again. Everyone <laughs> spoke so well. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for accompanying us today. And I hope you will team up again, part B. <laughs> That's it. Part That's B. It. <laughs> well,